You're listening to Talking to Teams, where we speak with leading experts from a variety of disciplines about the art and science of parenting teenagers. I'm your host, Andy Earle. We're here today with Dr. Tim Bono. He is the author of When Likes Aren't Enough, a book based on a class that he teaches at Washington University in St. Louis that has become one of the most popular classes at the university. And the class is about happiness and how to live a life of purpose. So he took all this wisdom and he's put it into a book. He is an award-winning teacher. He comments all the time in the media, in places like CNN, national radio networks. So super excited to get Tim on the show today and talk about how parents can talk about happiness with their kids and how you can give tools to teenagers to help them flourish more and be happier in their life, but of course do so in a way that they'll actually listen to, even though it may be coming from mom and dad. So Tim, thank you so much for being here. Can't wait to jump into this episode. It's my pleasure. I look forward to discussing all these things with you. So you wrote this book and it's heavily influenced by kind of positive psychology, but it doesn't just stay in the positive psychology realm. I think that you mentioned in there that one of the early titles that you guys talked about for the book was like proactive happiness or something yes. like that. Mm -hmm. um, I was curious what made you end up going with the title that you did go with and what are the factors that went into that? Sure. Well, you know, as you say, this is a book that is rooted in positive psychology and the science of happiness. And it has its origins in a class that I teach on this topic at Washington University in St. Louis that is really geared toward college students. Because one of the things that we know about college students is that on average, they're facing a mental health crisis with rates of depression and anxiety higher than they've ever been before. And so we think that these messages are applicable to everybody across the lifespan, but we especially wanted to target young adults who are going through this major life transition, finding themselves heading to college and trying to develop that, that sense of meaning and purpose that I think we all are after. And so as we were thinking about what some of the barriers to a sense of happiness and well-being are, one of the things that we kept coming back to is the role that social media plays and how so much of our society and our culture has this obsession with crafting this digital persona that, that looks really amazing and wonderful that usually isn't actually tapping the reality that a person is, is living in their day-to-day -day lives. And so we thought yeah. that this angle might be something that would draw a reader in uh, and be something that people could relate to. You know, it, it, This book is not to say that we should be getting rid of social media, but it is to say that when we've spent a lot of time on putting images on Instagram and Facebook that get attention from others, that if that isn't bringing us a sense of well-being as we want it to, and the research suggests it probably isn't, here are some behaviors and strategies that social scientists have identified that actually are capable of bringing about that happiness and well-being that, again, so many of us are seeking in our lives. I think that's really interesting. And our lab here at Loyola Marymount does work on adolescent risk behaviors. And we've been doing a lot of stuff lately looking at social media and the influence of social media on risk behaviors. And we're finding that it's really influential. You actually mentioned in the book that you have some data surrounding this. And I believe that it was some correlational data showing like a negative association between the amount of time that students spend on social media and then their their happiness or their level of flourishing in life. Is that right? Yes, that's that's correct. That in pretty much every data set that I've collected where I ask students to report the amount of time that they're using on social media, and then I look at other psychological outcomes that are associated with the use of social media, it's in exactly the pattern that you describe, where the more time that they're spending on social media, scrolling, looking through other people's posts, or, or posting information about their own lives, that is correlated with lower self-esteem, less sleep, less confidence, less optimism. And one of the most ironic correlations that also happens to be one of the strongest is that the more, the, the more time people spend on social media, the less connected they feel to actual people. 
which you would think that social media is supposed to be <laughs> connecting us to other people, and yet it seems to be undermining the strength of the connections that we have. And that's this very sad paradox, because one of the strongest predictors of happiness is the strength of our connections with other people, and yet mm -hmm. social media seems to be undermining that. So we are replacing the time that, that should be going or could be going toward actually building happiness by spending time with friends and family and we're, we are replacing that with a behavior that actually runs in the opposite direction. Social media is ultimately a means of social comparison, and that seems to be driving down happiness and driving up those rates of anxiety and depression. Yeah, a lot of people are talking about it right now. I think it's an important issue. And I like your approach to it because the statistics professors out there will all say correlation doesn't equal causation. So we don't know necessarily from this data that you've collected that higher social media use is actually causing these effects that you're talking about. But the fact that there's this association as a parent, um, if you're seeing your teenager on social media a lot, it means whether it's causal or not, there's likely some of these things that you're finding in your research and your teenager you know, potentially could be flourishing more. And and so some of these strategies that you point out in your book are really cool because there, there's like a fine line as a parent, right? Uh, we talked to this lady who I really love, Dr. Deborah Gilboa, who has a couple great books on parenting. And one of her big things is that as a parent, your child's happiness is not your responsibility, like to make sure that your child feels good all the time and is happy all the time. So there's that. But then at the same time, as a parent, you do want to give your kid the mental tools so that they will be able to make themselves happy or that when they do encounter anxiety, stress, depression, uh, that they will be able to be resilient and to bounce back. And so I think that a lot of the strategies that you talk about in your book are great things that parents want to make sure that their teenagers know about, but then... The question is, how do you introduce some of this stuff to your teenager in a way that doesn't make them defensive? Yeah, sure. And, and that's a really important question because one of the things that we know about these strategies is that if they start to feel like a chore, then people become less likely to engage in them and they're also less likely to experience the benefits that can come from them. Well, so, okay, uh, you talk in your book about internal versus external attributions. Yes. And so that's kind of what made me start thinking about this from the parenting perspective is, you know, yeah, you want your teen to learn these strategies, but you also want them to kind of to make them feel like they kind of found it themselves or something like that, rather than that you just made them do it as their parent. How does internal versus external attributions work? And what does that mean? Sure. So if something is drawn from an internal attribution, that means that you're doing it of your own volition and it's something that you personally want to have happen. And therefore, the outcome is going to be attributed to yourself. So that, for example, if you go for a run and you start to feel better and you start to feel happier, then the attribution is because of something that you yourself did versus an external attribution mm -hmm. might be if you do something that makes you feel good, but it's because of an external source. It's because someone else did it for you. Or, for example... Let's imagine that you get an A-plus on a term paper. Well, there's one of two ways to do that. One is because you had to work really hard and put in the time and effort that was necessary to achieve that grade. That would be an internal attribution. It's, it's because of you. It's because of the, of the work that you put into it. An external attribution might be yeah. something like um, you've, you downloaded the paper from online. So you didn't actually write the paper, but someone else did the work for you and now you're getting credit for it. So although you may have gotten an A in the grade book, it's due to some other source. Or maybe it was just an, an extremely easy paper to write. So the reason you got an A is not because of anything that you did necessarily. It's, it's just that the assignment was so easy that you can attribute the good grade to some external source like uh... the ease of the assignment. So that's the, the distinction that we draw between an internal attribution and an external attribution is the outcome that is associated with it, what is that due to? Is it due to yourself or due to some other characteristic beyond yourself? And I guess Martin Seligman has some stuff about how optimists versus pessimists tending to make uh, internal versus external attributions for various things, where optimists tend to 
develop internal attributions for good things and external attributions for like when things go wrong uh that was out of my control that wasn't my fault but like when they go Mm -hmm. well oh yeah that's because i made it go well versus pessimist like so it's not necessarily that internal is always good and external is always bad but it does seem like there's this related concept of the locus of control uh, an internal versus an external locus of control and so i wonder if helping your teenager to develop these internal attributions then leads to them having more of an internal locus of control and what that means. Yes. Yeah. And, and, that's, and that's really important because as you say, it can help develop a sense of optimism if you start to make those internal attributions when things are going well. And so one way to help children or teenagers to develop that internal locus of control has to do with the reaction that you might have after something happens. So let's imagine that they do bring home a report card with really good grades. Instead of just immediately saying, oh, that's great, let's put this on the refrigerator, you're so smart and you're brilliant, in addition to giving that feedback and celebrating that positive outcome, you might ask them questions like, well, tell me how you did that. Tell me about the study strategies and the hard work and the sacrifices Mm. that was required in order to earn those good grades. Because then you're really highlighting the hard work. You're highlighting the work that they themselves had to put in in order to achieve that outcome. And so you're directing attention not just to the outcome, but importantly to the source of the outcome. And the same thing is true of, of when things don't go well. So let's say that they get a C on a paper. You know, it's also important to say, well, let's think about the process by which that occurred, because then you're you're continuing to put emphasis on the component of that that is within their control so that maybe they they waited until the night before to start or maybe they used the wrong sources in the paper. Mm. Then you're you're leading them to a point where they can identify what they might do differently in the future. And that that proves to be very effective and very useful in allowing them to make those internal attributions and identify what are the things that worked well that they can continue to do in the future, and maybe what are some of the things that didn't work as well that they can change so that the next time they can come closer to achieving the goal that they have. By focusing on these internal attributions, is that going to develop in your teenager authentic self-esteem and what the heck is authentic self-esteem anyways? Sure. Well, when we talk about self-esteem, a lot of people assume that it only refers to how you feel about yourself so that it's always feeling good about yourself. And certainly that's a component of self-esteem is holding yourself in high regard. But just as important as feeling good about yourself is knowing how to cope with disappointment and adversity when things don't go well. Because everybody feels bad in that situation. Nobody likes to fail. But the true sign of self-esteem comes when you've worked hard on a paper, when you've worked really hard to achieve a goal or to, to train really hard for a sport and you still lose the game. That's where you really learn something valuable about somebody's psychological strength and their overall self-esteem. Because, again, everybody's going to feel bad in that situation. But the individuals with high self-esteem have this repertoire of strategies that allows them to bounce back and allows them to reflect on the experience and to think, okay, what are the things I could do differently here in the future? And they will do things to restore their mood. They will call a friend. They'll go out to the movies. They'll treat themselves to something special to sort of help them get back up on their feet and try it again. Um, again, nobody likes to fail. It's not that people with, with high self-esteem are somehow immune to the negativity that comes from setbacks, but they are more sure. motivated to persist even in the face of failure and say, okay, this didn't work out as I was hoping or planning, so I'm going to regroup and sort of from that develop a sense of mastery by engaging their social network and reflecting on it and extracting some meaning from it. It's very easy to look at people who have been successful and say, oh, everything they've ever tried has always worked out for them. Well, often it's the case that the people who have succeeded the most are also the same people who have failed the most. But instead of interpreting their failure as a signal of defeat, they instead used it as a source of motivation. And self-esteem can be very helpful in, in finding that motivation to keep at it to continue to work hard in in route to the particular goal that they have. So you said something really interesting in there that there's a really important situation that happens when we work really, really hard on something and then it doesn't go well. 
Yes. Why is that such an important situation? And what about the opposite? Like when you don't work hard and it doesn't go well, or when you work hard and it does go well. And why is it specifically that that scenario of working really hard and then having it not go well is unique? Sure. Well, you know, I'd say that it's in those situations where we are really developing that sense of resilience. It's an important life skill to know how to deal with disappointment. Because if we develop this schema where we associate that every time that we work hard, everything is always going to go our way, the reality is that that is simply impractical. There will always be circumstances or, or luck sometimes that just doesn't turn out in our favor. And so it's important to know how to cope with that inevitable adversity and disappointment because adversity and disappointment are a part of any person's path. You can, again, look at almost any successful person, and they will tell you that they had to surmount huge obstacles and keep going even when things were rough for them, even when things were not turning out for them. And that is often one of the distinguishing characteristics among the most successful people is that ability to keep going, to sort of forge ahead even when times were really difficult. And so if you have that ability to know how to persevere even when times are difficult, that skill set, that, that psychological strength that enables you to keep going, that becomes a skill set that continues to get stronger the more that you have to practice it. And that is what can propel you forward, even when things are not turning out in your favor. I get that. One of the big topics between parents and teenagers today involves technology and you know it's kind of a central theme of your book a lot of people are saying hey you know teenagers need to get more sleep and the reason usually given for that is their brain is developing the prefrontal cortex really important uh, lots of you know changes are happening in the brain during this time they really need that sleep which is all true but you actually point out some really interesting stuff, which I love because I think that some of the most important things that teenagers need to know is about how sleep affects their memory. And when I talk to groups of students about alcohol, this research that you talk about in your book is like one of the most important things I think they can get out of my whole presentation, um, how sleep influences memory and learning, and then how alcohol in there can actually like tank the entire process. Aside from just the the typical, yeah, it's not good for your brain to not get enough sleep, what are some other problems that will arise for teenagers if they're not getting enough sleep? Sure. Well, as you say, you know, I'd say that sleep is one of the most important behaviors that contributes to the overall well-being of teenagers. And there's a whole host of outcomes that are associated with the amount of sleep that we get. So one of those is simply on an emotional level. So we know that, that when we sleep, the brain is decreasing activity in, in areas of the brain that could otherwise lead us to become highly reactive to things that really on any other day might not be any big deal. And yet if we haven't slept enough, often we are on edge, we are cranky, we are irritable, small little things will easily set us off. It's because the brain wasn't given enough time the night before to do the work that was necessary to sort of cool down that area of the brain that now is highly reactive to every little thing. So one is simply on an emotional level. It sort of helps us to overlook all those small daily hassles and uh, stay focused on our work. Um, another big one is mental acuity. The reason why we often have difficulty staying on task toward our goals if we haven't slept well, goes back to the idea that we didn't give our brain the time that was necessary to do the work that would lead to strengthening those neural circuits in the prefrontal cortex that you mentioned that are so important for keeping us vigilant toward our work and, and on task toward our goals. Um, so that's another one. And also, the other thing that the prefrontal cortex does is it allows us to regulate our impulses. And that's why people sometimes will make bad decisions or they will otherwise find themselves in trouble if they haven't gotten a good night's sleep the night before. It's because they don't have as much willpower and as much self-discipline, which is essentially restored when we've had a good night's sleep. Um, so there's a whole host of behaviors that are associated with sleep, but I would say that emotion, cognition, and impulse control are among the biggest ones that can especially affect the day-to-day -day life and well-being of a teenager. We're here with Dr. Tim Bono talking about what to do when likes aren't enough. And we're not done yet. Here's a look at what's coming up in the second half of the show.
if you have that window open, especially college students will sometimes keep that window open in their class schedule so they can take a nap, and that can be very effective to do it. One thing that you want to avoid is taking a nap too close to bedtime because that can interfere with your body's natural circadian rhythm, which can then prevent you from falling asleep at 11 o'clock when you had intended to go to bed, which can then offset the whole thing for the next day or the next couple of days. A lot of people operate under the myth that they're able to multitask. And so they'll say, well, if I have a bunch of things I have to do, if I know I'm going to watch this TV show and I have to send some emails and I have to study for a test, that I'll have all those things open at one time. One of the things that we know about human attention is that it functions kind of like a spotlight. So if ever you've run crew for a theater and you have one spotlight, but you have a bunch of actors on the stage, you know that you have to make a decision about which actor is going to get the spotlight at any given mm. time. And that's how attention works. So you can think of each of those individual tasks, you know, working on the homework and watching the TV show and sending the emails as the individual actors on the stage. And you can only have your attention, only that spotlight on one of those tasks at a given time. There's a study that you mentioned in the book that blew my mind a little bit. It's a study that found that even when a smartphone is turned face down on the table, just the fact that it's there and that it's present reduces your ability to pay attention on other things. Yes. Another very effective thing is to introduce them to models to say, you know, it's not uncommon for teenagers to have difficulty maintaining focus on their work at school. Want to hear the full interview? Sign up for a subscription today. You get unlimited access to all the interviews I've conducted. It's completely affordable. And your subscription helps support the work we do here at Talking to Teens. Thanks for listening. I'll see you next time.